soon, soon present. It's a bit strange because on the course side there are about uh, seven to eight students registered. It means that they have registered themselves for this course. So let's see who is going to show up today or at later occasions. This course will be in English in September. And uh, maybe with the tip glass of you, we can present ourselves. And Daniel is a student of Russian at the BA level, right? Yes, there is. And this is uh, Roman. Roman? Yeah, hey. From, uh, and uh, Black. Hey. hey. Who are our best students from the Moscow uh, State University for the Humanities, okay. with which I have uh, some cooperation this year, uh, a network cooperation allowing students from here to go there and from there to come to us. And uh, on four of us should actually have been four of you at this moment, but uh, the two of us will probably be here next week, uh, Marsha and uh, Andre. So, and they will be following this course in September, so that's why we'll We'll stick to English this month later on, as you can see here on the, on the, on the uh, course plan. We'll change to Danish from the 7th of October, because then we'll be focusing on your coursework, you and the, hopefully the other Danish students' coursework. Uh, maybe you could just shortly tell me what you are, what's, what, what's the purpose of choosing this course for you? Well, um, I'm going to write about the aspect, I think, in uh, Russian. Uh, so, yeah, and it's relevant with the language course of some sort. So, and this, yeah, this is. So. Well, that's good, good to know. Uh, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. probably going to use a, a course in some sort. Yes. Uh, it sounds like the Russian national course. Yeah. Yes. And is it a BA project? Yeah. 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 Good to think about that. that. Um, yeah, and also the synopsis. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. It will be in the same area, I think. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, it has to. So of course, thematically it has to be divided, yeah, so yeah. there are different questions, but it can be within the uh, aspects, verbal aspects. It can, both, yeah. both of them, yes, yes, yes. That's allowed. Good. Um, since we are combining it in this way in September, we'll focus on the theoretical and the general theoretical and more uh, methodological matters about the uh, corpus and linguistics. Um, and let's have a look at the text in, in September, and then later on you'll be more practical uh, focusing on, uh, on, on your, your coursework and the coursework of the other day students. So let's uh, have a look at the textbooks. Um, I have presented, there are two of them, and these are some of the best textbooks in course linguistics in Danish. And you need not buy them. Um, you can see them here on the screen. It is up there, isn't it? Yes. <coughs> because they are available on a course shelf in the library. Second floor, you know the wind, winding stairs we used them yesterday. Second floor, just about uh, the floor where I have my office. And uh, there is uh, some shelves marked. Um, There are some here. And in this section there is a, a small section named Corpus Linguistics, based Language Studies in Snorkel Johnson. Do my name and certain names. And you, you'll find the books available there. But you're definitely not allowed to take them out. They'll also make a sound if you, if you try to carry them out. But so you must uh, uh, 
one after the other sit that and sit, sit and study them at the library. But if there will be only five of us, it should be possible to find the time. Is it so, so one uh, example of each. Well, these are the uh, the copies of the library because they have a service at our uh, department. Um, if you need some some uh, uh, textbooks for a course, uh, the librarians will will order them and put them there on the shelves so that all participants of the course can, can use them. But in the library, you can take them down to the first floor. It's more convenient to sit down there. There are more, uh, more study places on the first floor. So, so up and down, but not out of, uh, of this uh, section, uh, uh, staircase 10. Uh, Our department is, is located. <coughs> if you have any trouble finding them, then ask the librarians. So they have that uh, their office just next to next to the winding uh, stairs, second floor. Yes. But it should be very easy. It's one of the first uh, first sections of the shelves. Yeah. Any questions? Of and you can see that there are no readings planned for today. I didn't expect that to happen. And uh, then for the next time, there's a short reading. We are not going to read very much because we're going to see it in practice. Um, in this one, which is a bit older, it's the one from 2006. Uh, no, actually not. No, 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 no. no. Uh, it is a supplementary reading for the 9th of September. The basic reading is here, um, 23 pages. And this one, which is brand new, 2012, it should be called book, brand new. The first author you see, Tony McHenry, is the same for those books. So there's quite a lot of overlap in these books. But uh, it doesn't really disturb. It's, Sometimes a good thing to read the same in a different formulation in a, in, a, in a different way. But they are they are different and uh, probably in relation to the American and British courses they they serve different purposes. This one is a bit more technical, but it also contains more examples of corpus uh, based language studies. So today no reading, next time this one, and actually I decided for the, for the three last times of, for, for the three last lessons of uh, this theoretical section to, to use this one. Because the first, uh, um, the first chapters there are very informative and very basic as to what, uh, what, um, a corpus actually is. <coughs> so this are the and actually for you, Roman and Vlad, I have asked the librarians to order the two books you need for your other course, uh, language processing, mm -hmm. and put them on the same shelf. Mm -hmm. And that's especially for all people. So, yeah. <laughs> she said that they would uh, probably be there tomorrow. <coughs> Good. No other questions here. Let's start with today's work. Actually, the practical part is also some of the work. I do the presentation. Textbooks. Well, I actually said, uh, said some of it already. This is um, uh, this is what I just said about the textbooks. They need to be stay at the at the library. But note, I put this presentation on those, uh, the course uh, uh, the course uh, site and sent them to you to the, to the, to the Russian students as well. Uh, I have added this link because in the in the 
introduction to this, the, the, uh, the authors write that uh, there is a, uh, a site developing this uh, containing containing uh, what does do they call it? the companion a companion website for this book especially. But they give a wrong in the book. They print a wrong uh, address, uh, web address. But uh, I searched on the authors a little um, on online Kenway and found the, the, the new address. So this is the address, and it contains a lot of material and experience. In addition to this book, we are not going to work on this uh, website because we don't have sufficient time. But why, if you are really becomes engaged in corpus in linguistics and language space uh, and corpus based language studies it's um, it's absolutely uh, a good site to consult and course plan I need not say any more about that let's have a look at corpora and um, I feel Presented some of the very basic ones. Uh, for English, we have the British National Corpus, and here's one of the one of the links leading to it. For Danish, we also have a corpus, which we'll have a, a look at. Uh, we'll look around, around a bit because these corpora are pretty differently organized. Some of them, and the Danish is that. Different from the others. Yeah, I have a little stick here in my book. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And uh, the Russian National Corpus. And actually, some students of Serbo Croatian have registered for this course. That's why I. Uh, I have been looking into the. Serbian and Croatian Cobra. I know them already because I have a PhD student working on them. I actually know him from. Well, you were not at the conferences last year, were you? Right. Mm -hmm. We didn't meet last year, did we? In October. In the so conference. Uh, the Gensling uh, or TMD. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, mm, I was here uh, there, but uh, I didn't take part. I see, I see. Uh, well, yes, yes. But you know Martin from last year. Yes. He, is, he is working on this uh, program and are trying to have some benefit from them, but it is a bit difficult because they are at, uh, at, uh, they're only at, uh, uh, at a time of construction already. And they do not offer very many search options, uh, not complicated combined search options. But for students of Russian it's an excellent situation to do corpus uh, linguistics because we have this magnificent corpus. I, mean, I can't say that it should be one of the best in the world. Uh, maybe, especially in, uh, when, when it comes to um, um, the search machine itself, because it offers a, it is it is it is very advanced and offers a lot of possibilities. And also when it comes to annotation of the corpus, it's very strong. So it's an extremely strong corpus. The only ones I think that can compete with them, with it, uh, are some of the English and American opera and uh, the Czech corpus. <laughs> Because the Czech, they have a very strong tradition in uh, in developing uh, IT and uh, and language back and uh, um, mathematically based, all kinds of mathematical based uh, language studies, all back from the 50s, 1950s, at least just after the war. So they have a very strong corpus. But um, and Polish. We do have uh, students of Polish here, there's also a, a focus for them. Um, but I'm sure that any, no, I'm not sure that anyone has, has registered. If there are the only students of Russian, we know, of course, not going to 
able to concentrate on, on, on this copper. So if I have time, I'll, I'll just show you some examples today from each of the copper, so we can, we can get, an, get an impression on the, how different they are. Uh, not only in the, in the sense of strong or weak, offering many possibilities or fewer possibilities, but also in the, in the, in the sense of what they actually offer. <coughs> I have added library press display. I plan that we should have a look at that. That's a huge corpus, or maybe you should call it an electronic text library, uh, offered by students here. Uh, you need an access to your university or research library. Um, and I don't know if you have the access. But it's a huge, uh, huge uh, um, uh, newspaper collection. It goes far back for many newspapers. And I think that just in Russian there are about um, maybe 10 or 20 uh, newspapers represented. And so also some newspapers uh, printed outside Russia, in Russian, and there are several newspapers in Danish and they offer such possibilities and you can uh, for a specific time uh, time period you can specify the, the years and uh, even the dates as far as, as I remember and make, and make parallel searches and these are not just searches on word forms uh, I mean letter by letter if you, they actually have a text to it and electronic grammar of a, of a kind. So if you search for a word, you look at all the, the inflectional forms of the word. Is it how far does it go back? I can't remember, but we'll have a look at it uh, at a later occasion this week. Yes, and it, it's different for different countries and languages. But there are there are newspapers in 78 different languages. It is. A question if you should call it a corpus, because uh, a corpus needs, will we'll compare, these are some of the questions we are going to consider, what it needs for an electronic collection of texts and sometimes also video clips and, uh, to, to, to be named a corpus. This. Even in, in the broadest in the broadest definition, you could even call the World Wide Web uh, a corpus. Of course, it is a corpus in the in the very general broad sense. Um, but if it is, it actually and, and it represents different media, pictures, uh, movies, and the text. Uh, and it could call, be called a, a corpus, but um, it's not very practical to use this. It's a very broad definition of corpora. And um, we'll take the English, Danish, and, and Russian corpora to be examples of uh, or very well organized uh, uh, corpora for, for um, scientific purposes, not only in linguistics, but also in uh, cultural studies and in history and in uh, sociological studies. I'll try to. Present some examples. So, some teaching purposes. Uh, teaching purposes. Absolutely, yes. There's even a section of the Russian National Corpus which is focusing on pedagogical purposes. Yes, let's go on. Oh, uh, yeah. A young ling linguist in the early 1980s I actually brought us, uh, forgot to bring the material I, would wa I would wanted to show you. Because when I started up doing research as a scholarship holder, uh, what is now a PhD student, it was back in the early 1980s. You could say that I was actually working on corpora and uh, I was searching and got some hits, but how did I do that? The topic I wanted to study was use of
Problems in in Russian Polish Czech and Bulgarian later on I, 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 I added German as well so that would be a perfect topic for a corpus based study today that surely would well um, it depends on uh, which corpora you have accepted access to. Actually, no, that's not, that's not there. there was one more. So the press was also included. <laughs> and it's a different uh, it's an interesting topic because demonstrative pronouns they tend to develop into different articles in many languages. And they have done so in Bulgarian. Bulgarian has a different article like English and uh, and, um, and English and uh, most, uh, well, gen generally Germanic and uh, Romance languages have definite articles, and some of them have indefinite articles as well, like in Danish. So every time we use, um, now in Danish we need to, to choose between the indefinite and the definite form. And historical definite articles, they uh, they come from demonstrative pronouns, and if you look around in the in the Slavic languages, there's a significant difference in use. Uh, in Polish, they are much more common than in Russian, and uh, Czech is, is somewhat different, and Bulgarian is also different because they they do have the definite article, which makes the use of the demonstrative pronoun more narrow than in, for example, Russian and especially in Polish. So that's a good topic. And if we had a proper uh, corpus, parallel corpus, with parallel texts for all the languages, they are at a phase of being built, uh, of being established in series. They are not a very decent uh, 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 corpus of that time. It would have been great. But what I would have wanted to, to show you was that what I did was that I took um, um, uh, for practical reasons I, I had to pick some uh, literary works in Russian, fictional Russian fiction. I took some uh, uh, short stories by different modern authors and found translations of this uh, short stories and uh, sections of novels uh, into the other languages, into the other Slavic languages. Uh, they were all within the, um, the East Bloc of the Cold War. So, and there was a very efficient translation of Russian fiction within, within the, um, uh, the East Bloc. So uh, it was pretty easy, easy to find them. Um, and then I picked every tense Page, took the Russian text as my point of departure, found the corresponding sections in the other in, in the translated texts, and then started to point out to under underline to, uh, all the demonstrative pronouns and looked for their correspondences uh, in words or in constructions in the other languages, and actually I actually came to some results, but. You can imagine that first finding the texts and asking the library to order them from abroad and then uh, collect them and then read through all these texts and uh, underline the, the examples. And then what I did was to write them out on small cards mm -hmm. of the kind you used to, uh, to, to, to have in libraries. Old, li old library catalogs before we got the electronic catalogs. So I have on in my office office I can't remember five or six because I also did some other projects of these small cards with examples <laughs> written out with the correspondences in the, in the, in in all the of the of the Russian text and then the correspondence written in hand. 
<laughs> so that was the way we did it. It took an enormous amount of time to do it like that. But actually, it's exactly the same we do in corporate today. We isolate some texts and then we design a search. And then we run it, and in a few seconds we have all the material I had to spend months and years on to collect at that time. And it's not more than a little more than 30 years ago. I did this work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I know that uh, there is such a source like uh, Sketch Engine, and who we use it. Mm. Oh, of course. Uh, well, I didn't get the, the source of uh, Sketch Engine. The sketch engine. Sketch, uh, engine. sketch, and sketch engine, mm -hmm. engine. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and what would you, what was your comment about the sketch engine? Uh, mm, uh, we had uh, a course at uh, our Moscow University, and uh, yes. our teacher uh, told us about this source. Yes. And basically, as far as I know, but you must correct me, it's a, what you also call a search engine, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you have a corpus mm -hmm. without a search engine mm -hmm. attached, you can use this one. Mm -hmm. Is it something like that? Uh, there are a lot of corp uh, corpora uh, in this source. So I see. I see. I see. Well, maybe we, we should have a look at it. Mm -hmm. A certain point, yes. Yes, okay. In, uh, in uh, what language is? Uh, mm, Japanese, Chinese, Slovak. Uh, mm. <laughs> and Japanese, uh, Chinese, that's Slovak. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. And some Nordic some languages. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll just make so a note about it. I have maybe, seen. Maybe, I, I, I haven't. I haven't had a maybe, look at it. Maybe uh, there are about uh, fifty language, fifty European languages. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So it's a parallel, uh, parallel corpus project. Uh, and parallel to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, I think a sketch engine is a type of annotation, no? Mm. Yeah, of annotation. Uh, sketch engine is uh, it is a big uh, source. Uh, yes. It's a type of annotation. It's a source of parallel uh, texts. Yeah, uh, and uh, we um, uh, we can make we can create uh, our own uh, corpus uh, using uh, uh, other corpora, and uh, we'll uh, download some data from uh, from the source mm -hmm. uh, on our PC. Yes. yes, yes. But actually, I think you're right. It is uh, the, the it is a source uh, or an engine, an electronic engine doing annotation. But it's probably so that it's uh, it's it's stored on the internet together with uh, a multilingual corpus. Mm -hmm. Yes, I could imagine, yeah. I'll have a look at it and uh, think of it. Yes. <coughs> well, questions to be investigated. The most suitable question I consider to be investigated in uh, corpus, they are concerned with language variation and language change. So, um, those doing formalistic linguistics of the Chomsky type. Chomsky, you know, Chomsky is this. They have, they don't really need any corpora. So you must be interested in the dynamic side of corpus. Language in use, language in context. To design uh, a project with research questions that are that um, uh, comfortably can be answered by using corpora. 
And more specifically. Jeg kører lidt ned. Åh, oh, ja, ja. Sorry, 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 sorry. I've done that before in this room. So don't tell me, because I'm looking at the screen here. Grammar, that's a traditional sec uh, section of linguistics where you use corpora to, uh, to answer questions concerning variation and change. If you are of inflectional forms, syntactic constructions and other things. When we speak of variation, we usually take a synchronic point of view. For example, Danish in the 1950s, or Russian in the, in the late 19th century, or whatever it could be. And then you uh, study, then you observe that, uh, that there are some inflectional forms in variation, or there are some constructions in variation, and then you design a search to, um, uh, to show some aspects of that. And what you can do, what you can do there is uh, that uh, what, what's interesting about um, uh, variation or forms of that kind, but just to give you a few examples in Russian, so I'll come back to maybe uh, Russian in um, 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 verbs in a consonant followed by a semantic vowel ah, and then you can put on the the, the infinitive ending, so this is the infinitive stem. Uh, they, many of them have, a, a, have a variational forms in, uh, in, uh, in the infinitive stem. So, for example, I'm waving could be Mashu or Machayu. Well, actually, if you should put the, uh, if you should mark the morphemes, you should do like this rather than. <laughs> but uh, in textbooks, you will have a, a, a hyphen here. But uh, you know that in principle, the uh, stem is like this. A hyphen here, well, so, uh, well, that. and that's an interesting. Uh, Topic to study because it has been going on in, in Russian for hundreds of years already, and you could study. If you choose a specific period of time, it could be a decade or two decades like that. Then you should try to create subcorpora if you have a big corpus like the Russian National Corpus, subcorpora representing different channels, styles, and channels of uh, language use. So here you already see that what we focus on is, is actually language use in context, defined by the genre. We do a colloquial genres, that is oral genres, and uh, some uh, more form, formal genres, maybe neutral genres in between, and maybe fiction as a specific genre. And then they carry the searches there. And, uh, I actually had a student doing a project for a coursework of that kind a couple of years ago, and she was able to show that the more informal, the more informal the language is, the more you find these this forms. It's a coursework, it's not a big work, so it could probably have been uh, uh, refined in different ways. I have the, I have a strong feeling that um, uh, some verbs tend to use this one this form, which is historically the, the, the newer form, than this one. And uh, it, uh, actually, it sometimes is, uh, uh, sometimes depends on some other formal markers, if they are reflexive or not. Dvigas, dvigas and dvigas, uh, I think there's a, they actually also have this, this, this variation. Dvigu, uh, dvigu. Uh, but uh, I'm not so sure that it's the same distribution with the, with the non-reflexive and the reflexive form. So there are more things to do there.
of a significant would, you say, would you say to you guys uh, on visions? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> 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 linguists are not good informers. <laughs> It depends. Uh, it depends. It depends. Yes. On the visits, on the it's all right. That's <laughs> it's all right. Or, 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 yes, yes, yes. But sometimes even nature seekers get surprised when they mm. see the results of the <laughs> open searches. So that's a, a very good example of a variation of inflectional forms. But you can do the same uh, from a different perspective. You're going to have, uh, well, if you take uh, the, 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 the decades, decades in a row from the Russian National Corpus, you don't care about the genres, then you just take all the territories from each of the decades following each other and see how many, uh, many hits you'll find for each of the variation forms. It is a problem to combine these two points of view, and that's generally, it's uh, theoretically uh, an important point for linguistics, you probably heard about it. You can't really make uh, an investigation which is both synchronic and diachronic at the same time. And this is a good example, how would you... Well, you can you can somehow combine it, but then you have to make a row of synchronic investigations and then put them up on a page and compare somehow then you can uh, somehow combine it but the uh, specific when you are working specifically you have to focus either on a synchronic or base it either on a synchronic view or a diachronic view and I would say that the synchronic view is the synchronic investigations are primary to the diachronic ones. Diachronic investigations presuppose, in principle, a row of synchronic investigations. Okay, can you follow me? What the, I mean by yeah. that? Yes, yes, fine. fine. Well, that was a digression of Kant. But syntactic constructions, it's a bit, bit more complicated. It, uh, it uh, demands a strong search engine. Uh, but it's absolutely possible. Lexis, variation of use of specific words and idioms or other fixed collocations. Phraseology, as you say in, in Russian. Uh, these investigations can be done for uh, in a broad perspective. Um, for linguistic purposes, of course, uh, describing the lexicon and try to try using the context to focus on the very fine nuances in content in uh, in meaning of the words. And but also for sociological purposes, I'll try to share a very similar example later on in the next uh, next talk. Um, political language, media language, the variation of different words, the, the, the context you, to use different words and it changes over time. There was a drastic train, change in the in the in the constant of a uh, number of um, Russian words uh, related to politics after the breakdown of the Soviet Union and the establishment of the new Russia. And it's still changing, and it is not only in Russia, it is in all societies. So, uh, corp corpora are very good for investigating that. And that has to do with the size. The very strong difference between my, uh, the project of my youth, around the Democracy and Romance, and um, and um, corpus space language studies is actually the size. When, when uh, corpus linguistics was started up in the 1960s, you were very satisfied if you had a corpus with one million words. I hope to have time to show you one which 
uh, Russian corpus that was established. A very fine corpus of that, of that kind, of that period, that was established in Sweden. In, uh, in, in started up in the 19, about 1970. It was one million words, but it sampled very systematically and also has some annotation on it. The so-called Uppsala Corpus. Have you heard of it? Yes. Yes, yes the Uppsala Corpus. It's actually used sometimes still. But of course you can use it for some of the grammar investigations. You can't really use it for lexical investigations because it's too small. <clears throat> so the size is actually a factor. Uh, ah, what is a corpus? Well, I'm talking about this and that, and I've already been uh, commenting us on this question: what a corpus is? Is the web a corpus? But I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say that it's a huge collection of of data, which are basically linguistic, although some of them are also well, okay. Pictures as well. So there are all other sound systems involved. It's a bit irritating this automatic building is done with certain things. Sometimes if they open and close all the time. In that case, it's disturbing. <laughs> um, and let me comment on, oh, on point three the national corporal. This is the one I had a list of at the beginning. And um, all national languages of Europe and beyond, they strive to establish fine corpora this year. But uh, and it, and it, and it seems that the, the resources for this in, in Russia are pretty good. And there must be some politicians somewhere understanding that this is an important case. That's important to because there must be many people at the Russian Academy of Sciences Institute of the Russian language working on the course. Around there, do you have any knowledge about that? But there must be a big group of those uh, researchers, established researchers and uh, students at different levels. Uh, otherwise it wouldn't be possible. So, so, uh, still add new facilities to this already very strong force. In Denmark we have an organization called uh, sort of the, the, uh, the organization for developing resources for Danish, for the Danish, the Danish language and literature. The Danske Sprog og Kulturselskab. Yeah. Ja. Yes, the Danske Sprog og Litteraturselskab. Okay. Because the for Language and Literature and Organization. It's a semi-official organization. They do receive money from, um, uh, from the government every year, a certain sum, and they can do it with it. And they also have some, uh, some uh, private sponsors. And so, especially in connection with certain projects, but 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 they are they are building electronic uh, um, dictionaries and similar resources that are available on the internet, and they also are responsible. You could say they did, did it themselves, but they, they decided to be responsible for building the the Danish national corpus. But they have much less resources to work on. And that's of course a general picture that what you call the uh, the big international languages they have more resources. I don't I don't know Chinese and Japanese unfortunately so I don't know what they are doing but they are probably doing the same thing and have reached a high degree of uh, good strong corporal like uh, Russia and uh, Great Britain and uh, America. France, I don't know very much about. Neither do I know much about uh, Germany and uh, Cobra, but they are being Cobra. 
Then you see it appears that the Polish uh, focus is quite strong. What about the Spanish? Don't know. Don't know, yeah. but uh, it, it should be very strong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the most spoken languages in the world. But uh, it depends on how how they good at how good they are at cooperating in all these countries. <laughs> so that would be a uh, Port Portuguese. It should yeah. rather be Brazil working on it. The heat ruins it. Probably. Yeah. Pardon? The heat. Yeah. No, the heat. Yes, 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 yes. I know that there is an academy, a language academy in Madrid, covering the whole Spanish-speaking world and making resources and trying to register in probably a database today uh, the, uh, the, the variation within the Spanish-speaking world for each word and in for general patterns or pronunciation and so on. But, but I don't know how much they do and if they are working with proper today. Well, we usually make a break at this time, so um, let's do that. Excuse me, what's the difference between Croatian and Serbian corporates? There are different texts. Yes, yes. But so? They are absolutely separate. Okay. <laughs> for political reasons, of course. There's no doubt it has to do with the politics. Actually, the Serbians include some... They have a problem with some of the texts from before 1990, when they, uh, before the breakdown of, of Yugoslavia. Because there were some text published that couldn't really be said to be Croatian or Serbian. They could in the Lexis follow one standard and in this, uh, you know, this systematic uh, differences of pronunciation and spelling, um, they could follow a different standard. Um, and they, I think the Serbians tend to include some of these texts. But they do have a problem with the, with the historical part of it. I don't, uh, I, it, it doesn't appear that they have come so far that they, uh, that they, uh, that their uh, cobra goes, go very far back. Um, they're working with modern texts, basically. And they are pretty distinct. Not, not so that they are not understandable for, <laughs> for, 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 for the other, for, for those in the other nation, but uh, in the way that this um, pronunciation uh, slash spelling variation is very systematic. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's what Martin is trying to do using the Cobra so to show them what direction it goes. And generally, we know more in what direction it goes. Um, the Croatian are puristic, have a puristic attitude to their language. So they try, try to exclude as many non Slavic groups as possible. So they are trying to avoid English loan words um, and uh, replace them with uh, neologism, a new word based on Slavic roots. The Czech do the same the same, and here in Scandinavia, the, the um, Icelanders do exactly the same. But I can't remember what a computer is called in Iceland, but so it's uh, it's based on an old Scandinavian rule, so it's a uh, kind of meaning counting machine, but it sounds totally different. <laughs> so they are, in a way, uh, split from how they normally talk in the country. I mean, they they have English loan words. Well, they try to. They try to. In, uh, well, but the Serbians, the Serbians, they take any English loan words like uh, we do and. Uh, and I mean, can they control the the Russians do? Uh, can they control anything by doing this? They are trying to. They are trying to, and the national feelings are so strong that they yeah. have a certain success. But that's what Martin will be looking into. Okay. Which is in this I'll But it's... Yeah. I just had to go. Get yes. some food. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the 
language is alive and uh, it's difficult to control this process. Yes, yes. But you have some cases in history where you have a prescription, like a plan to do something and you actually succeed. The most, the most um, uh, maybe a, 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 a strange, a, a strange and remarkable example is the establishment of, of modern Hebrew, Hebrew. No, not, yeah, yes, Hebrew, I suppose, the, the national uh, language of Israel. So, because there were no speakers of this language uh, 110, 20 years ago, the first one started to speak as a home language at the end of the 19th century. Yes. I can't really remember the history of all of us, but it was a group of Jews in, uh, in Israel, immigrants to Israel, and uh, some linguists had established. One of the, the, the great things was uh, Holger Peterson of uh, that time. He was an interviewist and he was also a professor of Slavic languages. Yeah, so might be successful to stay here at the University of Copenhagen. He wrote, it, at the beginning of the 20th century, he wrote the uh, history of linguistics. Yes, it's not the best. And he noted that only the future will tell mm. if this fantastic experiment will succeed. And yes. surely he didn't <laughs> believe in it. But today it's, uh, it's a daily language of some uh, five, six million. And there, there are many speakers of this language around the world uh, because many Jews learn it. And uh, they all have relatives in Israel. So it, it is possible <laughs> if the conditions are there. And maybe it would be possible for the Croatians to, um, to go uh, not into the structure. Well, that's actually what Martin has already found out. If it comes to the uh, to grammar, uh, it's impossible to control. Mm -hmm. Even if you recommend some uh, constructions or some uh, inflectional forms in favor of others, it doesn't have it doesn't really have any effect. But when it comes to lexis, you can actually convince speakers to use some words rather than others if there are some feelings connected with it, national feelings, and at the moment there are in, uh, in Croatia. So, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so, by the way, what do you think about the future of uh, future of Serbian and Serb... Uh, как сказать, сербско-хорватский, сербско-хорватский язык. Out of. They have an, an Eastern variant and a Western variant, and they have, they have made a standard mm -hmm. of both of them. And you probably know some of the history back to the, to the 19th century. From the beginning of the 19th century, they started this discussion about the language among the Croatians and Serbians. And the, uh, the one uh, pleading for one language with variation was uh, Vukadic. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a great linguist and philologist of the late 19th century. And his very, his, uh, his very, uh, his very well respected today in, in both countries. I can't remember if he was a Croatian or Serbian himself. I should be able to say that. But that, that's, that's not so important. But it's, uh, uh, based on his authority that for a long, for several historical periods they have worked on creating one language just with 
to slightly different standards. Standards going back to the old Slavic yet. Mm -hmm. Another mm -hmm. one is Svet, Svet, Svet in 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 Serbian uh, and Svet. I think it now in Ukraine the uh, language is sweet, 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 sweet. 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 <laughs> 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 what did you ask? Uh, the future. About the future. The future, yeah. the future I think, there will probably be two countries and then two standards uh, and some endeavors to. Uh, to um, create more differences than you usually have for you can only do that in Lexus. Mm. By the principles of creating neologisms. The easy way is to take in the English word. <laughs> and that's what most languages in Europe do. The Norwegians are a bit hesitant. They tend to create a number of uh, uh, new words based on Scandinavian rules and so on. But the important point is that it's not a government policy. It's simply because they are linguistically so creative that, uh, that they uh, make up new words on Scandinavian rules. Uh, for example, a USB key. Uh, a USB key is uh, small sticks. You can put into a computer USB uh, and then uh, and, uh, take out uh, uh, the data. Uh, they have a, a word for that in, in Scandinavian. But it, it has to do with the fact that Norway is a new country and they used uh, Danish, uh, uh, Danish orthography onto even even until the end of the 19th century. Only then they established a different norm to norm. And they have two norms, you know. <laughs> so they are very, uh, very cautious about the language to protect it as a national language. So that's a, a third element. We're talking about the uh, uh, well, but, but different strategies for developing the language in different countries. <laughs> the Congo. Yeah, the Icelandic case and the Norwegian case. Oh, yeah. uh, how long is the break? Well, at, uh, well, we can take a few more minutes if you need. Actually, it's 15 minutes, so it should be, and we stop at uh, 3 minutes past, so we should have, uh, but do you need more time? Do you need to go out? Okay, okay, okay. actually, I'm almost continuous, <laughs> just more informal. But all lessons are 45 minutes, starting at 15 minutes past. Yeah. In Moscow, we have just one lecture. That's, uh, Endurance is uh, one hour and a half of an hour, so we have no break. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> well, it's a good thing to relax and also it often happens like this that uh, we somehow continue just more, just not according to the plan, but more informal. Well, let's go on. Well, what is a corpus library press display, which I'm going to show you later on, uh, is somewhere in between, what you could call it, because what, um, uh, what makes it a candidate for a corpus in a more technical uh, sense is that it actually has a grammar for each of the languages attached to it. So that uh, when you search for a word, for example, democracy, you will uh, you will also have democracies and so on, and, uh, and all the different uh, inflection forms in, in Russian and uh, and uh, languages with uh, rich inflection.
then we have a number of specialized corpora around specific periods of genres of a specific language. There are already a number of corpora for old Russian and uh, older periods of Russian. Um, there are not anything for Danish this far, as far as I know. But I think that there are somebody are working on They have rich resources in Danish uh, language history, so uh, there should be plenty of of uh, things to work on. But of course they are problematic, they are more problematic than historical sources because they have, don't have a unified orthography usually. That comes only probably at the beginning of the 19th century in most European languages. Before then you had different, uh, different standards, but Writers tended not to follow these different standards. They were more and more uh, based on they are they were more or less based on uh, tradition than actually written down. So there are many variations, and that's these are problems you need to uh, solve and establish uh, historical corpora, uh, corpora of historical texts. <coughs> And then multilingual corpora, we have already been talking about it with the, the sketch engine and there's also a, in, in Austria they are building up a corpus gralis, the gralis corpus, I suppose we'll have time to have a look at it, um, with many different Slavic languages and also German and English in parallel. And I'll come back to that, uh, what are the different types of uh, multilingual corpora. <coughs> oh, already here, yes. There are two basic types of multilingual corpora. A corpus including texts in one language, the source language, and translations into one or more target languages. That's actually what I established manually in my first project, <coughs> or one of my first projects. This type of multilingual corp uh, corpus is called a parallel corpus by McHenry. But uh, parallel corpora in, 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 in other sources and then by other authors are also, it's a broader term covering multilingual corpora in general. And the other time is that you have texts in two or more languages selected using the same sampling method. And the sam sampling, the question of sampling uh, we'll come back to. But you understand that that is picking out the text and putting them into the box. That's sampling. And uh, you have a strategy, a method, when you sample a corpus. You should have because you want to establish a corpus with specific uh, features and for specific purposes. And um, for national corpora, it would be some, uh, a thing like represent, uh, that is, is representativity, is it like that? I don't know. But you know, you know what I mean, that it should be representative for the language use of a specific period. Uh, covering all different sounds. That would be the sampling method used for national corpora. But for more specific corpora, it's much more specific, of course. And then you can like, take uh, what McHenry calls a comparable corpus by using the same sampling methods for different languages. That's a different way of doing it. It also involves, it's, it's, a, it's in a way easier, technical, because the first time, the first type shall be you need to establish an electronic link from every sentence in the source text to the uh, corresponding sentence in the translated text. So what you uh, what you get uh, the the hit you get uh, when you uh, use a, a parallel corpus a translation corpus 
uh, is, all, is usually uh, aligned for the source text and then uh, aligned for each of the other languages of how this sentence has been translated. But since sentences are not uh, the same length in, uh, in source text and, uh, and uh, in, uh, in translations, very often when it's not sentence by sentence you translate, you translate the text and sometimes you change the, the number of the, and the length of, of sentences, then it involves certain choices and uh, certain choices, those principal choices and also redefining these choices into technical so technical matters that the programmers have to take care of. But they are, uh, unfortunately, there are not so many and so uh, much of equal corporal so far, but they are working on uh, enhancing them and, and uh, enlarging them and uh, building new corpora of this kind. So for, so for the future, I think it's uh, will be very important. Annotation, I have mentioned it briefly a couple of times. Annotation is really what makes a text electronic text selection, selection a course. There should be some kind of annotation. And these are electronic markings of elements bigger or smaller in the corpus. Um, at different levels. A text piece, if you take a text piece, one of the texts available in the corpus, put into the corpus, it should be marked electronically with the time of production, what year, at least what year it was written, the author, the author's gender and age. It's not done in so many corpora, but it's done by the Russian National Corpus. That's fine, so you can actually compare texts of the same genre from the same period written by men and women. I don't know of, I haven't heard of anyone who has done so, but it's, it should be possible. And it could be very, uh, very inter interesting to also, try to do so. Also, yeah, also the author's uh, age at the time he wrote that? Yes, and then you should also, well, it's, it's a general um, principle in science that when you look for a variation, then you should fix all the other parameters. So you should take persons, for example, in the twenties, same age, same charm they're working in. It, they, it, the most easy thing is to take journalists, because uh, media texts are available in, uh, in, in huge sizes, uh, in, in huge amounts, I'll show that later on. But uh, fix all the other parameters, age, charm, what else would it be? Time, of course. Time section should be the same. And then you could look for the differences between male and female language. <laughs> yes. uh, I have a little question. Yes. Uh, do the Germans annotation and uh, the tagging uh, have the same meaning? Or there is a little difference. Tagging, what was tagging. It? tagging and annotation, as far as I can see, it's exactly the same. Rasmirka mm -hmm. in Russian. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <coughs> oh, Annotatia also refers in Russian section. No, it doesn't. Annotatia yeah, is. Rasmirka. Uh, Tosha is this point. Yeah. It's. Uh, we use uh, uh, the both terms, annotation and thinking, yes. and yes. annotats, and yes. rasmetka. Mm -hmm. yes. Medium, if you have a text, it should be marked if it was produced as a written text or an oral text, a spoken text. Of course it is. The actually, I have to add an established subsection in the Russian national corpus of spoken texts. So it's already there. Otherwise you can create your sub -corpora. <coughs> At the sentence le uh, level that would be a placement in the text piece. Some corpora at least they give each section, uh, each sentence a number in the text. 
but they could also um, uh, be, uh, be there could also be an annotation uh, specifying the syntactic structure of the sentence. Syntactic uh, annotation is less developed than morphological annotation, which is uh, the last point here. Uh, word form should be marked by the lemma, and the lemma is what you will identify as a dictionary word. That's a lemma. Um, word understood as a lexeme. Um, part of speech, of course, should be marked as a noun, a verb, an adjective, and so on. Syntactic fu function in the given text. Uh, a subject, an object, a predicate, or whatever. And then finally, inflectional features uh, for Russian nouns, for example, uh, yes, gen numbers. gender number cases. Yes. Okay. Animacy, mm -hmm. and so on. So that's a, a big section of the Russian, uh, a big part of the uh, of notation of, of Russian and other Slavic, uh, Slavic corpora because they are inflectionally so rich, much rich, richer than uh, Germanic and Roman, Roman languages in general. <coughs> and there is also semantic notation. Some semantic. Uh, semantic. 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 Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And yes, it, it should actually be here on the on the word form. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, if it if it uh, names if the noun names a person or an animal or uh, an object and things like that can also be uh, be tagged, be tagged. Um, um, So you have all this in the corpus. You have all this electronic um, uh, information connected to texts sentences and especially words. A uh, few words about annotation technique. <clears throat> well, when it comes to the text piece, when you select a text to put into a corpus, I suppose that it's always done manually. I can't imagine anything else. That uh, always, who, who's the author, at what time was it written, and so on. There are also age and sex and uh, what I mentioned. It must be done manually, and it's not a big problem because it's once, once for all, and um, a few pieces of information. For a sentence, it's usually done automatically. And also for the word form, at least partly automatically, by means of a, what you call a tagger, or earlier you usually called it a parser, uh, both means an analyzing tool. Uh, so it is a tool, a program, uh, supplying grammatical features to the words in the given context. And it works on a electronic grammar and an electronic dictionary. And then it runs through the text and supplies all this information we have talk, talked about. Uh, these taggers or parsers, they are pretty good. They are astonishingly good, I think, for most languages today. Because they, also, uh, usually, they actually provide the correct information at least in more than 90% of the cases. But full reliability has not been achieved by, as far as I know, but by any taggers. So if you want full, uh, full tagging, a complete tagging of a text and a corpus, then you have to manually go in and look at the automatic track, uh, tagging. You uh, of course run the uh, use your program, your tool to run the automatic tagging, but it will leave some questions and it depends on how the tagger is. Sometimes the tagger will say, I can't solve this problem, there's a, a value here I can't specify. And in other cases it will just, just leave it. <laughs> it depends on how advanced it is. 
but um, one again, once again, for uh, the Russian National Corpus is here very strong because it has a pretty large subsection which is close to 10 million words as far as I remember now, maybe it's well, 8 to 10, 10 million words uh, where Sasniata uh, Amanini uh, with Hamanami removed and Hamanami is what could it be? It could be something like Dajji, uh, 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 which could be the singular uh, genitive, dative, locative, and the plural. <laughs> so, um, these advanced trackers are often able to look at the context and determine which one is the correct choice. But sometimes they make mistakes and sometimes they simply leave it open. And in the Russian National Congress with Armonomy removed, it, it must have been, it must be so, I, I have heard about the procedure, but it must be so that some uh, uh, very uh, skilled MA students, PhD students, uh, researchers have been into each case and looked if the machine, if the tagger did the job fully or if there's something else to specify. It's the only way it can be done today. And it's quite astonishing that in uh, the Russian corpus, I haven't seen anything similar in any other corpus, uh, that it has been done for a pretty large corpus. So if you want to make uh, especially uh, searches for in inflectional features, it's a good thing to try it on this subcourse. Have you been have you been into using specifically the uh, the subcourse? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And we have used the old Russian corpus. Oh, uh, Russian corpus. Oh, Russian corpus. Yes. The subcorpus with the uh, human removed. <laughs> really? Really? Uh, sometimes. Uh, yes. Yes. I see. But, see. but, but in all it's a very strong feature. In all the other cases, I uh, the taggers just uh, do they just rely on the taggers? Yes. To, uh, and they leave the, the they, 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 they leave the open questions and mistakes as they are. Okay. Simply, and then they just uh, tell that, well, it's, yeah, uh, well, it's 93% correct, 94 it's always something like that. Okay. But uh, then, if, so you, you should, simply, that you should simply be cautious when you make, uh, when you work on copper, because you're not in control of the details. So you have to check them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But try to, especially if you do some grammatical, try to use, so start with this, uh, with, uh, with this corpus, because the annotation is, but well, it's probably not 100% correct, because that doesn't happen. No, no. <laughs> but it's more than 99%. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, and then you can see if for the phenomenon you are looking into, if the size of this Corpus is sufficient, then it will be fine. Yeah. But that's the way it's done, and that's of course the way it's done uh, uh, in the life of the press display corpus. It's used uh, uh, newspaper corpus I was talking about. They have simple, so simply bought an attack of each of the languages they have and, and run it, and that's it. So that'll be a certain amount of mistakes. Oh, yeah, that was all. Um, I would like to... Um, maybe since you know the, the, the Russian corpus, so well, we could start somewhere else. Let's have a look at the... How do I... Control. Ah, yes, I should do. Uh, ah. Control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it doesn't work. 
selection of texts. There have been some considerations behind what texts to include and in what amount to make it representative. <clears throat> so these are, I decided to show you these four features because they are actually sort of the basic features of general corporate. <clears throat> Yeah, let's go on. It might be interesting for you, all three of you, to have a brief look at the Danish course. Change into English to make it more comprehensible. Um, Corpus BK, let me see if I can find the information of it. Well, in short, it's a uh, um, Same page of dictionary of Danish language, the Danish dictionary, uh, which is the biggest Danish dictionary that was established from the 1900s and, 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 uh, and further. So, um, I couldn't think of. Unfortunately, well, and then I'll just tell you, I can't find the information here. Uh, the Danish corpus is relatively small. It's a 56 million words. And it's divided into two sections. What is called Corpus 1990, consisting of texts written about uh, two or three years around 1990. And then there is a similar corpus also of 28 million. Each of these cobra of 28 million words. It's called Corpus 2000. Oh yeah, Corpus. and Corpus 2000. And they are uh, consists of texts not from exactly that year, from the but from the years close to this uh, this uh, end of the decade year, and each of them are 20, 80 million words, and the sampling method is the same for each of them. So the strategy I haven't actually discussed it with them, but the strategy is pretty clear. It's for every decade to establish a a cut. As a, a section, um, not to cover the whole period in between, but make jumps of 10 years and then establish a, a corpora sample in the same way, of a relatively big size for those few years. And uh, so I'm really waiting for a corpus 2010, but they are probably working on it already and they could also go back. So that's a different way to do it. And maybe a fine way to use the limited resources we have for the United States. You can say we to work. Um, the, both the British, American, Czech and Russian corporate they are much more diverse, but they are less controlled. We would say the good thing about this this way of doing is doing it. Is, uh, is that you can make, make very controlled and systematic uh, searches if you make parallel searches in this sub-cobra. But you can also, what you have here on the, on the page is, is simply a search and you can make more advanced searches combining different words. And I don't understand why I can't find that now. Extended search, searches is maybe. Oh yeah. Well, 
one followed by uh, select inflected forms. Is it here? No. Here we have part of speech. That's part of speech. So select part of speech. Let's say we will have an adjective here. All right. And then followed by a new word and then followed by so you can show some different words. Basically it's close to what you can do in the Russian corpus, but it's technically quite different and it's it's not as strong. Let's take the word democracy. What kinds of adjectives are used in connection with democracy? That's democracy in Danish. And then search. So what we ask for is combinations of adjectives and the word democracy. Sort it in different ways. Sort by left context. Or sort by match. Uh, give me a second now. I'll just check. Yes. Then you have an alphabetical sorting starting with A. So what you get first is um, absolute democracy. Oh, I should have done the uh, the. Um, uh, the search uh, differently because this was a search uh, from the beginning that allows uh, up to three words between yeah. the two words. So <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Let's go back. Yes, we should from zero to zero. Yeah. Otherwise, we can't use it for any purposes. Hmm. So here we have, and then we have to sort it. Yeah. Now we get combinations of um, an adjective and uh, the word democracy in different forms. This is uh, the different form, the different article. This is the ET behind. Uh, so it means the, the democracy. And I think there is a way to exclude. Uh, what do you call it? What's that in English? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Wouldn't it work in Russian? Wouldn't it work in Russian? Democracy. Democracy. It's not in Pridinania. It's not in Pridinania. Come on, full stop, and so on. What's that? Uh, semicolon. Yes, and what are... What, what, what Rotation marks. Notation marks. Notation marks. Yes, yes. You can even exclude examples with notation marks if you want to do so. It will come to get it, uh, the exact match. But you see, uh, the American democracy and so on. And how many hits do we have? We have a thousand and thirty-two hits. Oh yes, I was looking for this combination. Souverain Democracy, because I know that in a certain historical period recently, Souverena Democracia was um, a concept in Russian media and politics. And it actually refers to that what we have is a democracy which is closely connected to the sovereignty of the country, 
uh, and it's different from Western democracy. Isn't that the idea of Subodhima and Democracy? Or would you say it differently? It was in the late 90s especially it was used, wasn't it? Or later? I don't know what is Suverenna Democratia. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't know. Suverenna Democratia. If you, if you uh, search on specific years, recent, pretty recent, 10 years ago, maybe from 10 to 15 years ago, in the Russian, uh, especially in the, in the media section, the newspaper section of the Russian courts, and you'll get a lot of hits. And they are politically loaded, strongly loaded. So it was a way to tell that Russian democracy is different from Western democracy yes. for those who are interested in pointing this out. I'm, I'm neutral, I'm absolutely neutral. It's just to show that if you, make, if, if you make such parallel searches, you'll get very different results. And I'm sure that those can be used in uh, political sciences as well. So what I try to plead for is that, uh, also emphasize is that uh, corporate are not just for uh, interests and be used for both purposes. And I, 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 I actually had a student uh, um, uh, writing a course on different conceptions of democracy in Western countries and Russia and, uh, and so on. And uh, yes, it was, it was, it was small. But you also have one. You only have one hit here: with the translation of of uh, sovereign democracy, and it has nothing to do with that. <coughs> yeah. Okay. All the items, all the items, can be better. Huh? All the things we can all eat. So we're in. All the eat, and it may. No. Yeah. 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 Well, what else would, should we have a, for Daniel? Should we have a short look at the Russian corpus? Yeah. And to make it briefly, here's some information and the Stoteberg Corpus, Staffistikultura, Statistica. It has to do with uh, what texts are in this uh, corpus. But let's go to a You can change language in the room, right? Huh? Oh, yes, you could change it into it, but it's okay, the Russian one. It's okay. Well, if you want, at, at the point where you need to read the information, yeah, yeah. you can change yeah. into English. It, 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 yeah, that's so. easier for you. But let's make a brief search. Yeah, but it's this building, I think. The other buildings are fine, but... Yeah. 
this one is kind of excluded. It's, a new. Really? it's already it's always a uh, bad reaction here. Uh -huh. yeah. so. Has some blind spots around. Mm. Well, I do know a problem with there, but it's called. Mm. Yes. So, uh, um, I'll speak less about it than. Uh, well, maybe I could speak about the principal question, how it is, but we'll use it less than maybe I can and come back to it and so on. Um, uh, well, firstly, it gives a choice of, uh, of uh, uh, finding a specific word form, an inflective form, for example, does G, but um, if you, but here, lexica grammatiski boys, then you can write, I think you can write any inflectional forms, but usually you, you write a nominative of a, of a noun, for example, and they'll find, and they'll search for all inflectional forms of the, the given uh, word. So let's try to do the same. And it's so then you need no more. So, ah. No misspellings? No, 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 what's, what's, it's, 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 it's this is nonsense, this is nonsense. Because uh, you have the word, you have the grammat uh, grammatical um, features, and just for Daniel I can open it and show you uh, the parts of speech, uh, cases, uh, number, and so on, and you can mark it for things. Yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got see both. Oh, you have had a look at it, good. Um, and then you have the second word. Oh, we can uh, yeah. choose. We can choose again, uh, female gender, and maybe we will see sovereign democracy. Yes, okay, yes. <laughs> yes, it, it doesn't really work well. This, that's right. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, maybe it's, uh, it's uh, normal. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think it's doing better and better. Because I've been using this corpus for many years already, and uh, it's, 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 it's more and more reliable. So they are actually working on it all the time. And if you need more words, you can hear the ballot slow if you want to search for three words in a, in a row. And sometimes I have designed some very complicated. Many words in a row and uh, specific features of each word, and it, it simply broke down and <laughs> it couldn't do it. So there's a certain limit. But let's see how many we find. Just to confirm my thesis. Sovereign democracy. <coughs> four documents and four hits. <laughs> Not very much. I'm pretty sure that you'll have... Uh, this is what we call the basic course. Let's... This is a basic course, so it, 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 it was with some representation. But you also have a <laughs> multi, multimedia corpus. This is uh, nothing. Multimedia, is that the one with the, with the newspapers? Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. I know uh, multimedia, that's of course... Gazirnam, uh, Gazirnam, that was one also. Are you sort of searching all of them at once? Or? No, it doesn't because it would be too much. Mm. Just okay. um, uh, this is a newspaper corpus, and by itself it has all, almost 13 million words. So it's huge. And I'm pretty sure they have established this as a specific corpus because it's not balanced, it's not representative, of course. But newspaper texts are very easily available and they uh, and there are no copyright problems with them and anything like that so they can simply add and add use newspapers and uh, so uh, for those so they have 
establish that next to the basic corpus. They don't go away. But here you see there are more. <laughs> and from what period of time are they? 2011, 11, 10, maybe are you, you too young to remember that period of time? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but it was a huge... Maybe I don't know politics. <laughs> <laughs> But it, yes, so they are actually within a very short period of time established. So uh, it's simply just a, a, an interesting philological, uh, politological question of the use of uh, uh, adjectives. If you go, go into more details, you will find many, many other interesting things for a different period of time, for adjectives you use to deal with democracy. Well, I showed you this example to, to demonstrate that it's not just about linguistics. Well, see you next week. Hopefully, some more people. Yeah. Yes. You don't know any of the ones? Yo, uh, uh, you want to say, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, I mean the people. Yeah, yeah, for Francois, I saw. Yeah. And Probably a lot of other people. But, uh, Francoise actually registered because he wants, she wants to, uh, to write, to, 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 to write uh, a course Okay. So that's a project. Yeah. But not within this field. All right. But she has to register in order to be allowed so, for the exam. No, oh, she could just wait for the exam. Well, she could, yes. I'm doing that. I You're mean, doing that. Okay. I mean, I chose okay. this for my. Then I, I gave her some misinformation. For the other project, and then yeah, but, yeah, it's very complicated. It is a bit complicated. Have you studied Danish, or are you uh, no. linguist? No. We said linguistic typology. Okay, okay. Yeah, a bit like uh, learn Danish a bit during our stay here. Yeah, okay. How long have you been here? Uh, four months. Okay. Oh, you must have picked up something then. Yeah. Have you been in four months? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Oh. We will we, be in Danish by one month. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 sure, sure. Yes. Do you have just been here? So, yeah, this thing. Can I do a Ah, I think I'm there. No, I think I'm there. She is not the revival. Now you are there. Yeah. Are you sure? Are you sure? Bye. 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 Okay. Okay, that's it. So on. Sure, same. We are finished. We are finished. Peter Hilje. Peter Hilje. Peter Hilje. Peter Hilje. Oh, det er ham. Det er ikke oh, det er ham. Ja, ja. Ja, ja. Ja. Ej, jeg kender ikke nogen af de andre. Altså, det er de mennesker, der har været i celebration. Ja. Så lad os se. Lad os se, hvordan det løber. Men denne skole er også fint. Absolut. studying the Danish language or something? No, no. Well, all right.